Tonight on EWTN Live, we'll learn about an Algonquin Mohawk Indian woman who converted to Catholicism despite intense family and societal pressures and persevered in her devotion to the faith and personal holiness to become the first Native American saint of North America. So please stay with us. Thank you, thank you very much, and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we get to bring you guests from all over the world. Before we get to our guest, I want to mention that today is the Feast of the Dedication of St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican and the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. This is <clears throat> important for a number of reasons. St. Peter was crucified in Nero's Circus, which was a racetrack. You can even still see part of where the seats of the racetrack were. There's a rise in Vatican City, where, and it's right underneath it. And after he was crucified there, they buried him in a cemetery, and St. Peter's Basilica is built over that cemetery. While St. Paul was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen, citizens had the right to be beheaded, a faster execution. And so he was buried near the place where he died, and that's outside the walls of Rome. Now, what's important about this is both of these basilicas, which are two of the four major basilicas of Rome, both of them were built by Constantine. After he legalized Christianity, he didn't make it the religion, but he legalized it. And after the worst persecution in the church of the Roman Empire under Diocletian, it was legal to be a Catholic, and he was paying back what was destroyed by his predecessor, Diocletian, and letting these churches in. It's not only commemorating these apostles, but also the victory over that worldly power of the Roman Empire. And it's a sign that the Church of Christ whether with its buildings or without, will always triumph over the enemies of Christ. Now, tonight we have a guest who is a producer, director, and filmmaker who has worked very closely with EWTN over the last several years to provide insightful docudramas such as Footprints in the Wilderness, which is about the North American martyrs, and Sarah, Ever Forward, Never Back, about St. Junipero Serra. His latest project for the network represents EWTN's first original motion picture. Never done one before. The title of it is Kateri. It's about St. Kateri Takawitha, and it premieres tonight at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, right here at EWTN. So please welcome the writer and director for Kateri, Mr. James Kelty. Thank you. Jim, Thank you. Good, good to, to be have here. you. Yeah. Great to be here. First of all, it's good to have you back. Well, you know, we were here two years ago. Yes. And at those days, the process for St. Junipero Serra had not yet been finished. He was not yet canonized. That's now right. he is. That's right. And uh, also, in that time, uh, St. Kateri was not yet canonized. Now she is. Uh, correct. We've got to see who else you're going to work on here. <laughs> there may be a pattern, but be that as it may, it is important that we have this Native American saint. You know, she was half Algonquin and half mm -hmm. Mohawk, right? right? Right. In both of those tribes, were they not both part of the Iroquois Federation? The the Mohawk were, but the uh, the Algonquin were uh, part of the. Uh, 
uh, Federation of Abenaki uh, uh -uh. tribes okay. further north in the St. Lawrence Valley. Okay. So she was, the mother was um, captured in a war and brought down against her will to Mohawk territory where she was adopted by the, by the clan, by mm -hmm. the Mohawk clan. And uh, uh, Kateri was born in, uh, in 16, uh, 1656 mm -hmm. in a little village called Osernanon, that's yes. the Mohawk name. Today that's Orisville, New York, mm -hmm. and that village then moved and so on, but that's, that's, uh, right. yeah, the, that's the, her origin. The <clears throat> villages were necessarily somewhat mobile because they had to mm -hmm. follow the yeah. game and the crops. I believe, yeah, part of the main reason that they moved them was because the cornfields would exhaust the soil after a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. and they would move for that reason. And there's other reasons that uh, villages built like that would, would you know, come to ruin after a short time. Sure. It could be a war, too. Mm -hmm. uh, the French came down and, and burned them uh, several times. Mm -hmm. It's, <clears throat> you know, this is um, also part of a, a larger history and an old history. Mm -hmm. The various uh, nation, Indian nations, you know, or, or native uh, nations, did not get along with each other no. before any of the Europeans came here, yeah. and the Europeans used their various animosities and allegiances yeah. and oppositions as a way to also fight each other. So this, they became proxies. They were as, proxies. In the, such in as the, great yeah. powers still do to other Colonial nations. Colonial wars, yeah. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, the, uh, the, when Champlain uh, came to, uh, the St. Lawrence in about 1608. Uh, he formed an alliance with the Hurons and they came down into Mohawk territory on a, I guess it would be a, a scouting expedition. And at Lake, what is today Lake Champlain, there was a confrontation and Champlain himself actually killed several Mohawk uh, chiefs. Mm -hmm. uh, they say several uh, at, a, at a battle and ever since then, those two, the Hurons with the French, Mohawks, eventually Mohawks and English, they were, they were in conflict. 50 years of that. Now, <clears throat> here's one of the questions. Did the missionaries who came uh, from your, now, as a matter of fact, m almost all the missionaries in North America came from France. You right. didn't have many English missionaries no. coming here. No. No, yeah. Rucolais were the first from France, and then the Jesuits. Uh, and Rucolais is that a family name or Rucolais is the the name of the order. Okay, so yeah. so the Rucolais order mm -hmm. came here first, right? And then uh, early six early sixteen hundreds, the Rucolais were here. Then uh, the Jesuits uh, more or less took over in the early well sixteen fifteen mm -hmm. sixteen ten mm -hmm. sixteen fifteen sure all the way up until uh, the uh, the uh, 1700s. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the, it's, it's interesting that the English did not send missionaries wow. uh, to the, the, the Iroquois or the other uh, native uh, nations here in, in uh, what's now the United States. They, they just ignored them fairly much. Well, that's not their style. You know, no. they, they, uh, they don't go to, to change people. They go to, well, they went, the colonial power, England went to um, for furs, trade, um, tobacco. control, territorial control, mm -hmm. tobacco, yes. Um, the French had a civilizi civilizing mission and the priests had in uh, particular a Christianizing mission. And they, I think it's fair to say that the French took a, an interest in the, the Indians as people, mm -hmm. uh, much the way the Spaniards did in California. Mm -hmm. or, and in Mexico, and they took, they, in, there were a lot of abuses, but they, they took them, they, 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 they meant to, to civilize them and to um, bring the word of God to them, of course, uh, but they cared about them as people. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, it, it's <clears throat> something that, a, a part of understanding the, the, this meeting of the two cultures, Native Americans, uh, at, at, as a matter of fact, nowhere in the Americas, so north or south, had they developed the wheel. No. They had no alloys. Right. They had fairly limited 
domestic animals. They had yeah. no horses till Europeans came yeah. and cattle. And so you have a culture with superior technology mm -hmm. and one with inferior, mm -hmm. but natural resources. And that is an right. easy imbalance for one group, the, the dominant group, to, to exploit. Yeah, yeah. And it's always a temptation. Uh, Norman Borlaug, who's the, the only uh, person who ever won the uh, Nobel Prize for Agriculture, once told me that if the Indians had had draft animals, um, they might have come over and discovered us. Right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> so but that was, that, but that was a big one. But were none here. It's not that they didn't domesticate, it just didn't exist. They didn't exist. Let's take a little clip from Kateri, which is gonna premiere tonight. Uh, and get a little idea of some of what was going on. How did you get out of here? You have two toys. Two toys. Onion. Did you make this? In my room, I make pots. Why? Because I am with pots. My eyes and my face. It looks very nice to me. I'd like to learn how to do it. That, that's a scene where you see the, uh, the uh, in fact, some of the priests say in there how the older women were really the strong force mm -hmm. in the tribe and yeah. and they were passing on a tradition of their skills and beauty that they that they had right. available to them right um, <coughs> that that scene is the first uh, the where we meet Kateri for the first time in the film mm -hmm. and I uh, wanted to establish the fact that that weaving was was very important to her and as you say the the passing on of crafts and so forth what she's weaving there is, is called a wampum belt. That, that could be used as an item of trade, a barter. They could even have treaties uh, designed into those. And so the, uh, the idea here was that she made a mistake in the, in the weave. And the stern ant there is taking her to task for it. Um, but we find out in reality, she wanted to put that mistake in there. I, I got this idea from uh, a Mohawk um, lady who was uh, a very adept at weaving and she explained to me that, we're, and that this is something that a lot of the audience out there will already know about, it's called the weaver's flaw. It's a, it's a deliberate mistake in a mm -hmm. pattern mm -hmm. and the reason they do it is a sign of humility because only God can create something perfect. Right, yeah, yeah. this, is, this <clears throat> is the case uh, among uh, weavers of carpets in the Middle East. Right. They always put a mistake yeah. on purpose. Well, it's, a, it's a common idea. Because only God is perfect. Yes. And you know, so you see that this is a woman who is coming from a, a, a culture that is mm -hmm. truly Mohawk. It, it's, she's right. not someone who is partly raised in, let's say, the settlement of Quebec or something, but she is fully oh, yes. Mohawk, and she is part of her culture. And mm -hmm. she, it is as somebody from that culture and within that culture that she comes to right. her conversion. Right, uh, and as you mentioned before, alluded to it's a matrilineal society, so the women had a great deal of, of prestige. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a debate whether they ran things or not, but I don't think so, but um, they were very, very important, and the lineage was 
um, matrilineal, mm -hmm. so that it, when, a, when a man married a woman, he moved into the woman's lodge, right. not the other way around. Right. So that man was adopted into to the mother's, uh, the, the, the wife's clan mm -hmm. or uh, group. Right. Yeah, that's, that was a significant Yeah, patrilineal mm -hmm. is what we have, yeah. where you generally take the name of a father, but Correct. in their society, and in a number of the, the native nations, yeah. Hopis and others, it's also, mm -hmm. you go in by the mother. So that's, that's right. very, very common. Right. Um, and, you know, for her to make the move to become a Christian, mm -hmm entailed a number of things. There was a, she right. became fascinated with mm -hmm. Christianity. It held a fascination for mm -hmm. her, not just because of this, this you know, stronger culture or more technological culture or right. something. It's not that. Right. There's another attraction. Right. Um, I, I think that, uh, well, we know a lot about what happened to her in her early life um, from primary source accounts and, and putting pieces of a puzzle together, we know that she would have witnessed horrific scenes of, of, uh, of uh, war and torture, and uh, one, can only, one can only suppose that she had a, a sensitivity uh, to, uh, and a receptiveness to new ideas and, and to possibly a, a changing way of life. At the time she lived, the missionaries were coming, you have to remember, the French missionaries originally were missionizing in the Huron territory up in the St. Lawrence Valley, right. and the Huron were their allies. This is a completely different situation. Right. Now they're down in enemy territory. There's, a, there's been a truce, to, more or less of a truce declared. The Iroquois are not defeated, but they're, there's a stalemate. So there's uneasy peace. The missionaries are allowed in, but they're not really uh, liked mm -hmm. or, or wanted by most of the traditional people. So there's a tug of war going on, and the war for the hearts and minds, and certainly she was uh, in that battle. She she was, she did not, the missionaries entered her village in uh, 1667, and she was not baptized until 1678. So, so uh, a good 11 years before. 11, I think it was nine, I might have my dates a little okay. wrong, about nine years. Okay. That may owe to the fact that she was adopted by the chief, and that meant that she had status. That would have been diffi more difficult for her even than the others mm -hmm. to make the, to make the, you know, the move. Mm -hmm. But, um, it's, uh, it's a fascinating uh, uh, story, and we don't know what moved her heart. I, I suggested things because right. um, it, the, the script and the process of learning what we could learn left a number of things on, on said, and so I move right so in. you just filled in a couple I gaps. I filled in a few gaps. And, Sounds you know, like Hollywood. Whatever. The, <laughs> 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 Let's go ahead and get Beth Lynch in on this conversation. Beth Lynch is from Orisville the village of Osunon uh, at one time, uh, Orangeville, New York. And she served as a historical consultant on the Kateri film. Beth, you there? Yes, Father how, Mitch. How are you? I'm wonderful. Good to Better speak. Better for your asking. Uh, it's good to speak to you again. You too. Now, at, uh, at Orangeville, you have both the, uh, the shrine for the North American martyrs. Some of them were martyred near there, correct? Yes. Yes, and three, and and then you also have uh, nearby the shrine of uh, Saint Kateri. Exactly. Yep, she's right across the river. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, tell us some of the other elements of who Saint Kateri is. Well, th what you've been talking about, I think uh, you brought up some very excellent points because these villages and where Kateri grew up were crossroads. This was a, a time in history where new cultures, new religions were coming in. And so Kateri was, I think, the, the way Jim said that, that she had a sensitivity to, to new ideas. I think she was a very bright little girl. But I believe that she also had this keen spiritual intuition. And she recognized something that she wanted. She recognized something that was missing in her own uh, native spirituality. And she recognized that those black robes had the answer to what she was looking for. And this wouldn't have happened if she wasn't in that crossroads, the geographic crossroads, as well as those crossroads of time where different people and cultures and faiths were coming into the picture. Mm -hmm. See, that's, you know, one of the 
very important points that you know we can see in the movie uh, as well as in this conversation, Beth, is while there's a certain romanticization of native culture and its oneness with the ecology and such, you know, they did sometimes over farm. Mm -hmm. They did over hunt. Mm -hmm. They did have war long before the Europeans came, and not just the Huron and Iroquois nations, but you know the the Cheyenne and the uh, uh, um, uh, Apache mm -hmm. had long animosities, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, the Sioux and the Plains and so on. Th there were tensions among these mm -hmm. nations, and it wasn't a perfect culture, uh, like no. European was not perfect. Of course not. And but those the, conflicts the, were in the families as well. Mm -hmm. How um, so? And we can bring that right to, to Kateri's family, you know, mm -hmm. her mother being a, a, a Catholic convert and her father being a chief and uh, having that Native American spirituality. She was born into conflict. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she could see that even in her own parents, I think, even though she was a little girl, she certainly would have sensed that there was something very different about these two people. Yeah, and the attraction for her was toward her Catholic mom's spirituality, which is interesting. Let's, if you don't mind, Beth, we're going to take another look at a clip from the film Kateri. I must speak with them before you kill them. No conversion for them, Black Rope. Our fire is short, yours long. They will have both. Sayada! God isn't here to protect one tribe against another. He's here to stop you from killing each other. Gakuita! Our white father pleads for the adoption of captives. Te lago, naise ni noge, naise ni ne yega go. Kongulungwe. Waisali wanu, when ege. Again, this speak, you see in this scene that the priest is being, uh, bringing a Christian mm -hmm. perspective. He's not siding for those that might support France. No. Or be against England. Or, he wants Christ to bring peace among all of them. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's very key. That, that, that scene was drawn from an actual uh, account of a an incident in the village of Gondawage did not occur when she was that age. It was in 1669. There was an attack on the village, a counterattack by the Mohawks to capture uh, the enemy tribe that had attacked them. They brought back 10 captives. And a father, uh, Pierron was his name, a, a French Jesuit uh, was there. And he, he pleaded for the, uh, the sparing of the captives. Finally, that was a, not going to happen. So he he pleaded for an opportunity to uh, talk to them, just uh, pray with them, teach them. I don't know, you can't convert anybody that fast, mm. but uh, you tried to intercede on their behalf. Right. And uh, so that's, that actually happened. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Beth, do you have any comments on some of this? Uh, yes, her, it, what Kateri what Kateri witnessed as far as the, these, cap, these captives, the torture, the warfare, I think uh, made her sensitive, too, to the theology of the cross, because once she learned about Jesus and who Jesus was and how he suffered, she saw that, that the Iroquois and the Huron idea of, um, 
of power, you know, that you get power from someone if you torture them. Kateri saw it finally as sacrifice, as sacrificial love, rather than this, this greed for power. So she kind of turned on its head this whole uh, Native American idea of taking power from one tribe to another. And she did that through understanding the blood and the cross of Jesus. Yeah, it, it's, you, you see what a, a contrast it is, because with a number of the Jesuit martyrs, their hearts would be eaten, mm -hmm. you know, right at the time of their death. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. they would cut their heart out immediately mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. order to get power of their strength. It was this absorbing of power from outside. That happened. And the Christ's death and the martyr's own self-understanding of the death is they are giving themselves. And that's what I think Kateri could see the difference, the taking from others versus self-gift mm -hmm. as love. And I think that's what uh, mm -hmm. seems to be yeah. the attraction. Yeah. Yep, I think that's exactly right, the self-gift. The self yeah. You know, and this is one of the th things that, you know, uh, today there are so many um, ideologies that come in to politicize conversion mm -hmm. and to see this in terms of power plays still mm -hmm. of who is taking power. And instead of us going into that mentality, which would be the mentality she was withdrawing from when she came to Christ, we need to look to this movie and to look to St. Kateri as someone who teaches us to do the same no matter what culture we are in. It's not a culture of taking from others. Mm -hmm. And we do that in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And instead, how do we become a culture where we are doing self-gift? That's what conversion meant for her and must mean for us. And we should learn that from her. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any doubt that what had to have uh, had the biggest impact on her was the, the demonstration of, of love and, and giving by the Jesuit missionaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, certainly Father Lamberville uh, in my film, uh, demonstrated over and over that um, there was a test of wills going on in that village, but he was not going to win the hearts and minds by uh, dictatorial and uh, threats of violence and, and force. He was yep. going to win it another way, and that's what it's about. As a matter of fact, he had no physical, no. military, or technological power to overwhelm the chiefs or the, yeah. the, the warriors, he had to do it by sticking with what's true and calling them to that higher truth yeah. than what they had. Yeah, yeah, moral authority. Yep. <clears throat> and, and you see, you sense that, uh, that his superior is a tough guy, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, it reminds me of the Jesuit um, principals at our high schools, they're real tough, whereas we're just sweethearts in the classroom. <laughs> no, that's okay. not true either. Okay, whatever you say. <laughs> yeah, whatever I say, or else. Um, but you know, it, it's, it, it's that, that difference mm -hmm. uh, and in, of um, calling us to a conversion to be like Jesus and to find the strength from Jesus to be self-giving. Mm -hmm. Certainly not all the Jesuit missionaries were the same kind of person or the same, brought the same kind of message. And that's not, you know, hard to understand. And, and I think we'd be, you know, we'd be less than truthful if we didn't portray some of that. So, and I think that that helps this movie quite a bit to show the contrast. And then of course our, our stern disciplinarian uh, softens in the end. So yeah, yeah we'll- uh, They all do. They always do. Okay. Say, so, you know, when we, at our <clears throat> high schools, the motto is don't smile till Christmas, and then barely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's the way you keep discipline in the classroom. Right. And he was sort of that model, you know. But, but again, eventually you do smile and let them know that love of Christ, yeah. you know, and that, that, it, that's it's true the other that, side of that love of Christ. It's absolutely true that she had a tremendous impact on uh, the fathers up at the Canadian mission that she fled to. Mm -hmm. uh, the end of her life, the last two years of her life, um, had a tremendous impact on, their, on them. As it seemed as though her 
faith and, and, and devotion exceeded theirs in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, where they were taken aback by it. And uh, two fathers that wrote biographies of her, it's obvious if you read between the lines the way they felt about it, they were somewhat taken aback by how just devotional she was. Uh, and that's why she's canonized and, they're, and not. they're not. <laughs> okay, good point. Yeah, you know that it, 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 canonization is not about um, some political affiliation yeah. or any such nonsense. It's about being like Christ. Mm -hmm. And she, she demonstrated that to mm -hmm. them. And though they were the ones who came as missionaries, she was the one who taught them deeper yeah. holiness. Maybe turn the tables a little bit. That's not unusual, mm -hmm. not unusual. Yeah. You know, you, you, <clears throat> certainly most of us who have taught in the classroom are delighted when we have a student who is superior to us as teachers. Then you're just helping them learn some mm -hmm. things, but you want them to excel. If you have mm -hmm. any kind of decency as a teacher, yeah. you want them to excel. Right. And this is a very important thing. Beth, are you still there? Uh, yes, I am. Any yeah. other comments that you have on, on Kateri? Well, I think uh, her humility, too, is, is what so impressed them. Um, because she came to them for, uh, for guidance and for the truth of the faith. And I, I think the, the phrase or the comment that she made at one point just so sums up her, her whole journey and conversion. She said, who can show me what pleases God so that I may do it? And there it is right there. If we, if we would all answer those questions correctly, it, it, there we are on, on the road to sainthood. And, and Kateri knew that she couldn't, that the, the shamans weren't giving her all the answers, that whatever uh, the Dutch reform that were around weren't giving her the answers. She recognized it in the black robes. And once she saw what they were doing and she could um, copy that or learn that, one of them called her a holy bee, like a bumblebee, going from flower to flower, learning this and learning that and, and integrating it so that could, she could get closer and closer to God. And so this was very, very impressive to them. Yeah, I should say so. Beth, thank you very much for Thanks, having Beth. joined us. Thank you, Father Mitch. Good to see you, Jim. Good to hear from you. And we have to go to a break, but we'll be back in a couple of minutes. We want to get some of your questions and your comments, so please stay with us. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to remind you that EWTN's first original motion picture, Kateri, premieres tonight on EWTN at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It will re-air this coming Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, which is movie night here at EWTN. Um, <laughs> I remember back in 84 telling Mother we should have a movie night. She said, oh, that's a good idea. Um, so I'll take a little credit. <laughs> but but they, they did their own thing. Also, you can get a copy of Kateri for your own, as well as the other movies that Jim has done, uh, Footprints in the Wilderness, which is on the North American Martyrs, and Sarah, Forever Forward, Never Back, all directed by Jim Kelty. They are available at EWTN's Religious Catalog, 
which is EWTNRC.com. Or you can call them in North America. It's 1 800 854 6316. And if you are interested to learn more about St. Kateri Tekalitha and the North American martyrs, there is a book by Matthew and Margaret Bunsen called St. Kateri, Lily of the Mohawks. Also, there's another book by Evelyn M. Brown called Kateri Tekawitha, Mohawk Maiden, and a video called In Her Footsteps, the story of St. Kateri Tekawitha. You can get all those and more at EWTN's religious catalog. This is something that would be a wonderful set of Christmas gifts as we have this relatively new saint. A great way to get people to look at this, okay? All right, we also have a caller. Hello, Peter? That's right, yeah. Peter, Peter. where are you from? I, I live now in St. John's, Newfoundland, Labrador, province in Canada. St. John's in Newfoundland. Yeah. I have been there. Well, <laughs> we're half a time zone, I guess, uh, I don't I know, know it's four and a half old, hours away east. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, you're the only time zone that is a half hour I know. <laughs> off. Yeah. And, you know, I ha but I, as a, you know, as a United States citizen, make no comments about Newfie jokes and anything else related to that. <laughs> Nothing. We'll pass on. The only thing I re regret that when I was in Newfoundland, they ran out of seal flipper soup. <laughs> So, oh, is that right? Well, we have yeah. seal flipper dinners here, which are big fun fundraisers. Here. I know it. I know it. They were all out, so I would yeah. have tried it. <laughs> anyway, what is uh, your question, Peter? Well, if that's your question, I, I just wanted to make a statement. Uh, I, I worked on Cattery. Uh -huh. My role was production designer, and I organized, helped Jim organize the Canadian component of the shoots uh, last year. Did he but do a good job, Jim? Uh, Pardon me? Uh, could he all I'll say is that our, uh, one of our lead actors, uh, Lou Pember, who played Iowa Rano, said, you need 25 of him. <laughs> so. um, well, it was such a pleasurable um, to work on that. Like last March, like I came back sometimes exhausted, but just loving every moment of working on that and working with Jim and all the actors and the, all the crew. It was just, it was hard work, but it was positive. Um, it was one of the best productions or maybe the best I've ever worked on in my career. You know, I've been in the business for 35 years. And um, the, the, the interesting story, you know, they say God works in mysterious ways. I was up in Attawapiskat, in the subarctic of Canada. I, I teach media to uh, uh, native kids here. And uh, so I get flying in bush planes going north. And I was just took a camera and I did a free video for somebody up in Attawapiskat. And it was about the windows they made in a Catholic church in the native community. And one of the windows I was very interested in was about Cattery. And I asked questions about that. Why is she so important to you? And, and why did you put her in this window? And the interesting, uh, I find that in many of the native communities, Cattery is uh, an icon, and uh, way before she became a saint. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is I come back from Attawapiskat, I come back to Newfoundland, and it says, okay, what's work is next for me? You know, I was working on some fishing shows, and then I get a call from Jim. Somebody referred me, whatever, and I found out he's working on Cattery, and I just thought, interesting. I was just looking out her window. I was just, you know, curious if somebody would ever do a film, because I know it's not an easy story to tell. And so that's really more or less, uh, I'm saying, I'm giving compliments to Jim, and that he pulled it off and was able to pull together a, a really very interesting story, and a story that I feel, um, well, especially the character you are discussing earlier, Lamberville, who, in a sense, is walking uh, the path of Christ, and I just see that in that movie, yeah. and, a, and, a, and a beautiful feeling I get from it. And the music that Jim uh, put to it, and, and all the acting. I just, just, just no criticisms. I really enjoyed well, watching well, it. Well, that's pretty you, good. You can kind of hear why he was good to have around. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter uh, also uh, produced the film on Saint Jean de Bre uh, Saint Jean de Brebeuf, <sighs> the one that you referred to as having his heart cut out for the courage value, mm -hmm. one of the eight martyrs. So Peter did that. So Peter really knows the territory, and we were really, really fortunate to have him. 
Yeah, and you you did some of that filming in the cold of yeah. winter. That's right. Because uh, uh, <laughs> one of the guys from EWTN, Sean Brown, went yeah. up there, and uh, he, I told him to prepare, so yeah. I gave him a, yeah. a warm coat. Yeah. He didn't think he would need it until he got there. We were it's very, cold. very fortunate that uh, I was praying for snow. We, we, ta we planned the shoot December, I think it was 12th, 13th, and 14th. I figured, okay, the lakes won't freeze over yet, so if the storm comes, it'll still dump snow. You know, there's less snow after they freeze, right, Peter? Right. And then, so we were praying and hoping. And um, no snow up until like December 11th. We flew in on the 11th, I think, and that night we got a snowstorm hit us and it snowed the whole next day. Mm -hmm. We got a foot and a half of snow in about, you know, 20 hours and it made that shoot. Yep. It made yep. that shoot. That's, that's <clears throat> cool. Yeah. yeah. We have a question here from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Uh, on what day do we celebrate uh, St. Kateri's feast day? So when do you have It's it? July 14th I uh, it was just recently, in the United yeah. States. I think Canada, maybe if Peter's still there, he knows. They, they may not have a different day in Canada, I'm not sure. Um, for you Francophiles, that's the Bastille Day also. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it, why, why was the 14th chosen, do you know? I don't. I don't either, I don't either. I don't. I just, maybe, maybe somebody knows, yeah. big calls. But it is on the 14th. Yeah. And, um, and that, that, that's uh, a feast we celebrate here in the United States. Um, the storming of the Bastille, yeah. I think, only liberated one person. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it was uh, there. So uh, we will celebrate t uh, Kateri. I always do. Yeah. Both of them. Uh, also, we have another call. Hello, Eric? Eric, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Sure. Where are you from? Uh, Florida, and now I'm in Alabama. Okay, and your question? Um, it's more for Jim, but what was some of the difficulties in making the production of Kateri, as well as what was some of the issues in taking a Christ making a Christian film for the screen, you know, staying true to the saint, as well as, you know, making it entertaining? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah I like answering that kind of question. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the difficulties are, of course, that you've got a, a, a subject in a, in a foreign culture, two foreign cultures, France and and uh, Moha Iroquoian, and so how do you make that believable? Um, we worked very hard to have our actors, uh, those that played Indians, learn Mohawk. I got uh, with some uh, Mohawk speakers, there's only about 20,000 left in the world, I understand, could be wrong. Um, we got with them and I sent them the elements of the script that needed to be translated into Mohawk. We got that recorded, I put it on a CD and I sent it to the actors and they just, hit it out of the park as far as putting the time in to make it believable. I think they just did an outstanding job. That was one of our hurdles and challenges. Um, the convention we used in the film was if an Indian is speaking to an Indian, they spoke Mohawk. If a European is speaking to an Indian, vice versa, they spoke English, which would be French. But, you know, these are the conventions you have to adopt in making a movie, and they're pretty well accepted. Uh, the other difficulties were creating uh, that world, which was uh, the 1600s, upstate New York. We built longhouses out of uh, materials uh, that we could find and, and get cheaply enough. Um, that, was a, that was a big challenge. Uh, certainly being in a remote area where you couldn't have any modern uh, telephone poles or planes flying over and all that. Right. Fortunately, I live in an area kind of like that. So that was another challenge. Um, what else did you, oh, about it being uh, accessible to a Catholic audience as well as a, a general audience, and um, I tried to portray all the people in the film, or get the people in the film to portray themselves as real people, even Kateri, although she's a saint today, she was born a human being just like all the rest of us, she became a saint. And so I wanted to convey her humanity and all, and the humanity of all the, uh, the actors as well as they, they could do so, in especially our Father Fremin, who's a disciplinarian, you talked about that before. So they're flawed. These people are flawed like we're flawed, and I think that if they are presented that way, they present themselves that way, and the actors did a wonderful job, that the audience will relate to them more than if they seem to walk on water, you know? Right. You've seen those kind of films. I, I don't think they work. I think that 
the more we portray the real world. Uh, there's the filmmaker um, Jean Renoir, who was related to the painter, I think it was his son, said that the closer we get to the um, spiritual, the closer we get to the real. Uh, that's an interesting idea, but I, I really think that uh, God is in the phenomenology of, of, of everything that we touch and see. And I, I'm not introducing a heresy uh, here, I hope, but I, I think that um, the idea is that it's, it's not up in the sky. It's, it's everywhere we are. It's in us, every breath we take. And, and so when you, when you portray the humanity of, of, of a person, um, the, the audience will go to that, you know. Uh, that was the idea. I hope that, that kind of answers the question. It, I want to say one more thing, if I could, before I forget. I counted 133 names in our credits from, you know, the producers on down to the, to the extras. 133 names is not a very big number for a, mo a movie with this, uh, as ambitious as this was. And I remember every one of you, and I, I want to thank you, uh, for, the, for what you did, the dedication you, you put into this, and uh, I'll always remember you and uh, remember your face. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things you were saying before, you know, uh, it's uh, St. Ignatius Loyola, you know, the founder of the Jesuits that mm -hmm. were portrayed in the movie, spoke about how one of our tasks is to find God in all things. Mm -hmm. It never means that God is mm -hmm. anything, mm -hmm. but you can find God everywhere mm -hmm. in every part of life. Mm -hmm. And it's a part of growing in sanctity is acquiring that sensitivity mm -hmm. to where God might be acting, including in negative things. Yeah. So that we rejoice in the fact that Christ died on the cross for mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. but we also have to find God in our own sufferings, mm -hmm. right. as well as in our successes, in the beauty and in the ugliness. And, you know, we're going through clashes of culture today mm -hmm. as we exactly. see terrorism around the world. Mm -hmm. And we have to look, where is God acting here? Mm -hmm. And how do I cooperate with God uh -huh. and not let this be for politicians to draw power Mm -hmm. Such as we saw with, you know, the the the, uh, the Mohawk, and the other tribes were trying to draw from each other power. Uh -huh. That ha that's a human problem. Mm -hmm. It's not a Native American right. sin. Right. Modern people do that, and our task is not what do I get out of these people? Where do I find God in what's going on and mm -hmm. in the processes mm -hmm. of transformation. Uh -huh. And that's part of our task. Right. We right. have another Hello. caller. Hello, Lou. <laughs> Lou, are you there? Uh, yeah. Oh, hi. This uh, is the Chief wh Iowa wh where, where, where are you from? Yes. Yes. Hello. Hi, where are you from? Uh, well, I'm from, uh, I'm from Arizona. Where are you, how, how are you guys doing? Fine. Um, uh, you were part of the film? Um, I was. What did you do? Well, uh, if you watch the film, you'll see that I, uh, was a Chief Iwarano. Okay. He sees the IR. Do you have your TV on, maybe? Uh, it was a minute ago. It's actually uh, okay, good. lowered now. Good, okay, good. good, yeah. Um, so the, so you played the Chief. Yeah. I did, sir, yes. See, I couldn't tell that by seeing the film because I've never seen you. I don't have yeah. one of those romper room mirrors where I can look back at you. So, so you <laughs> played the chief and did a nice job, by the way. Oh, yeah. Very well, nice job. Thank you. Job. I, I wanted to call and just congratulate you know, Mr. Kelpie on, on his work and, and everyone else who, who was in the film. Lou, you were, you were superb. And um, I, I auditioned the, for this part in Los Angeles. And um, I had picked my, my, my Iowa Rano, I thought. And I, in fact, um, even, even told him I thought it was going to be him. And then L they brought in Lou Pimber. I didn't know there were anybody, anybody else auditioning that day. I thought it was over. Then they brought in Lou, and um, he just blew me away. Okay. Uh, it, he, he, it was 
Lou, you were great. And uh, very dedicated, very conscientious actor, very meticulous in his preparation. Thank you for, for, for what you did. You know, well, thank you. Thank you for uh, taking the time to put the story together and, and giving me a shot to come out and audition. And, and thank you for your kind words. You're, you're welcome. And, you know, one of the things that I think it's also important for folks to understand is that this really is acting. That, yeah. And it's not sort of hanging out on a set. Yeah. This is a skill. Oh, yeah. And, and it's a well-developed skill yeah. that Lou and others yeah. bring to acting. Yeah, they, they, say that, um, uh, they say that directing is casting. casting. Good directing is casting. And so once you've cast the right person, it just happens. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's very much uh, the, tr the case. Yeah, that the actors need to tap into something they, and find a character and develop some, that and present it. And that's, that's some, a great Some of them need guidance and, and of course, and, and coaching and, and, and suggestions and things like that. Some of them, they just do it. Mm -hmm. they, 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 and, they, and you know when, when you've got it. We have another caller. Hello, Darlene. Hi. Hi, where are you from? New Hampshire. Great. And what's your question? Well, actually, it's just a comment. Sure. I just wanted to thank him for making movies that aren't filled with despair and sadness and, and everything's terrible. I think everybody loves movies about saints. Um, there's just something about seeing lives of ordinary people that become saints that gives the whole world hope. Yes. Yes, thank no, you. I, yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's um, you know the, the, one of the reasons we do have movie night where we sh do movies about lots of different saints, and you mm -hmm. see the struggles. Um, uh, we, we had somebody in the audience that asked about the one on Bakita. If you had done mm -hmm. it, so it was an Italian yeah, it co uh, company that that did that. But a wonderful movie about uh, an African slave who becomes a saint. You know, and mm -hmm. then also in the 20th century, the slavery is still around in Africa, still is wow. there in Africa. Yeah. Powerful. Still is. Yeah. And, you know, the, the story of St. Rita, you know, you see her develop, mm -hmm. you know, and just wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. movies that, you know, we need heroes as we mm -hmm. see so many movies, a, a genre that present anti-heroes ever since the 60s. Yeah, you had some individuals, you know, in, in the, you know, uh, you'd, you'd get a few movies. Casablanca has sort of an anti-hero, but mm -hmm. the anti-hero uh, becomes very common. And then the violent stuff mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. 70s since mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. It's so good to have mm -hmm. something that deals with human struggle. Because mm -hmm. that's key to making a movie, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the way I look at the, uh, the, the process of, of making a film like this, is to portray the people, God doesn't come down and solve their problems for them, even though they're saints, or going to be saints. He, they solve their problems through their faith mm -hmm. in God, which I think is a very big difference. Yeah. Uh, and that's what makes them heroic. And uh, we always show the struggle. You have to show the struggle or you don't have a story. Exactly. It's, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But, it, but to, to see how they do struggle Mm -hmm. And that sanctity doesn't come easy no. for the saints either. No. You know, that's no. part of life. That's like you said before, why they're saints and we're yeah. not. So. Yeah. yeah. And it's mm -hmm. you know, something for us to, to see this uh, as what lifts us up instead of the kind of humor that we see on television a lot of narcissistic egomaniacs mm -hmm. doing absurdities. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't lift us up, no. you know, in, in, the, in the modern comedies. No. This, this is something that gives us the, the core of what's human. Well, I hope so. You gonna make any more? Well, yeah, we, we've been talking about a number of different ideas. Um, you know, we've, we've got a movie uh, coming out this month called Spotlight, and we're gonna hear about the uh, priest abuse scandal again with that. Yes. And I, th I think that's fine. I think that story can be told and, and so forth. And that's if it's true. I also think that that same uh, agenda is the forum for stories about heroic priests. Uh, in particular, we, we've been looking at uh, chaplains, military chaplains and 
Um, 76 priests died in World War II in combat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Vietnam, uh, Korea and Vietnam, I think yeah. more than that. Yeah. Um, these are men who, who, who went into the heart of the battle and... Uh, well, it's, you know. so we're going to maybe do something on the chaplains. Maybe. All right. Sounds, I'd like to see that. Again, you can see Kateri be on tonight at 9.30 Eastern time and repeat it on Saturday at 8 p.m. or go to EWTNRC.com to get a copy for yourself or 1-800-854-6316 to get that. Any other books on her? Jim, thank you very thank much. You, and I want to bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for being with us and you for being with us too because you make it possible for us to have this show, to have this movie, and to do all that we do to evangelize through this medium. So please continue to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. And we'll pay all these bills too. Thank you. And God bless. <laughs>